I don't want to be very rich. I don't want to be powerful. I don't want to live in other place than Paris. Um, no, I don't have crazy dreams. I'm so sorry to disappoint you. Asia. What first comes to mind when this word is pronounced out loud? Exotic fruits, blue ocean and white sand, Buddhist temples? Or crowded putrid back alleys, where the air rings with the constant cries of the impoverished city dwellers? Asia is a land of contrasts, a land which simultaneously inspires delight and disgust. Each year, thousands of tourists come here in search of the mythologized spirit of Asia invoked in their guidebooks by images of brightly colored robes and spices. Yet our film tells not of Asia, but of people who in coming here have perhaps more than simply the search of stereotypes in mind. Every Monday, the newly arrived volunteers are taken on an excursion. The attentive staff of Project Abroad, one of the many organizations with a presence in Cambodia that coordinate the work of international volunteers, tell them about the city where they will spend their immediate futures, show them the local sites and, of course, the places where they have been assigned to work. Usually these places include schools, nurseries, hospitals and orphanages. Like many Asian nations, Cambodia is a country with a complicated history. Today, we are discovering royal palaces, wondering at the scale of the new building which houses the nation's fledgling parliament, and delighting in the mystery of the ancient abandoned city of Angkor Wat. Yet barely 30 years ago, the streets of the nation's capital were awash with blood. The history of Pol Pot and the genocide which his regime, the Khmer Rouge, unleashed is well known throughout the world, Yet the histories of its victims are known only here in Cambodia, where every family has its own story of loss to tell. My name is Bume. I was 27 years old when Pol Pot's army captured me, my wife and our family. That day was the last time I ever saw them. My wife was murdered on the killing fields and my children starved in the camps. I was one of only eight survivors. I was lucky. All the time I was here, I was tortured by electricity I was whipped on the back and I couldn't sleep. One day, when there was a mass execution, I was chosen to draw a portrait of Pol Pot. I was very lucky, as I was an artist. I'll always remember everything that happened here. If someone was brought before the court in the evening, it meant they were killed the following morning. Like my wife, now I have a family, but not one day passes in which I don't remember my first love. I'll always remember my first wife exactly as she is in this photo. In my memory, she will always remain 25. C21, in which more than 16,000 people were killed, was once the largest prison in Phnom Penh. Their bodies will never receive a proper burial, yet the relatives of these victims still come here with the aim of unearthing some information about their loved ones. Pol Pot and his collaborators once engaged in the perverse practice of routinely photographing each and every one of their victims. A special stool was even designed for this very purpose. The executors could not have foreseen how future generations would search tirelessly through these photographs, nor the reaction of those fortunate enough to meet with the gaze of a familiar face and to discover at last the date when a relative, friend or lover met their end, that their memory might be honoured on that day at the local temple. Phnom Penh's Monument of Independence creates a powerful effect on the viewer, more enduring, however, is the impression left by Chong Ek, a soaring tower filled with the skulls of those who perished here in Cambodia's notorious killing fields. The future is impossible without the past. But what is to be done if that very past refuses to give way to it? The children you see here do not go to school. They do not play in the local park and they do not sing, at least not for free. These children are forced by poverty to work on the streets, their parents do not dream about their future. Their most pressing consideration is how to survive from day to day. These are the slums, and here, as in the time of Pol Pot, there are no doctors and no teachers, no visitors besides the occasional curious foreigner who comes to hand out a little money and take a photograph. Yet one foreigner has chosen to become a more permanent presence here in the slums. His name is Thomas. He is not a doctor, he is a volunteer, and today he is here to work. 
obviously the people don't have a lot of uh, money or no money at all. They live very basic, uh, no, no fresh water, not much electricity. And it was really hard to see, especially the kids, how they live there. And they really don't get a real chance for, for the future. Some of the kids are allowed uh, by their parents to go half day to school. But there is still a lot of kids uh, which are forced uh, to do child labor, earning money for the family. So they are either collecting rubbish uh, in the city or they uh, are selling some stuff uh, on the roads. So just to get some money for the next uh, rice, for the next food for the family. Uh, well, it's uh, both sides. So Maybe starting with the terrible thing is always when we go to the slums and we have to clean rooms of the smallest childs or even babies. Uh, so if we're going to clean them, uh, it's gonna hurt them. And they, they really uh, cry or even scream. So this is not a very nice experience, even though if you know that it's gonna help them, but it's in this moment, uh, the kids are really suffering. So this is the bad part of the story. Uh, and the nicest parts are like, uh, Either in the slums, when you play with the kids, they, they smile, they are happy, even having nothing around them, living in, in such poor uh, circumstances. And also in the center, where the kids uh, live. Even the kids have suffered so, so bad things in their life, they are so happy, they are, get so attached to you, so they hug you, they, they play with you, so it's really nice and uh, yeah, gives you a good feeling to, to help to improve a little bit. Thomas has already lived in Cambodia for around half a year. He has fallen in love and has no intention to hurry back to his usual life. Yet among the impulses that lead to volunteering, visions of romantic altruism are exceptional cases. I was not like I want to be, I want to do volunteering, I just be, I want to travel, I want to discover Southeast Asia, so why don't be useful? But I didn't do that like, yeah, I want to be help everybody. Yeah. I'm not the saver of the world. Nope. At the beginning I had some issues with taking care of kids because I'm not very really comfortable with that. But now it's just perfect. The, the first time I went here I took care of about a little boy. We had a no, he had a, a bone fish in the in the foot. But like not like the spine of the fish, I know how you call that in English. And like pretty deeply and it was like fucking bleeding and fucking infected and he didn't say nothing. I almost, I was digging into his injury, just hug me at the end, it was just great. When I went here and when I'm in Paris, I'm way more stressed and nervous and now I can really feel the difference, like to be calm down, relax. I can do that and I just not, I'm just not able in Paris and I think I'm, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm more open to people have because in Paris it's very difficult to meet like good people. If you are in a bar, you are in fun. Even if the guy is the guy or the girl next to you is very friendly and nice, you will never speak to him or her. It's like everybody is in his group. And so now I just discovered to I had like yeah I had a lot of stupid conversation <laughs> with anyone here, but I had like pretty very very interesting conversation with totally strangers and I've never I've never I've never lived that before. He is not here to save the world, but he is studying to be a surgeon and one day will make a career out of saving people's lives. He never dreamed of becoming a volunteer, yet after he finished his placement in Po, he turned down the opportunity to travel the country and instead remained in the orphanage to care for children. Here he is not only their doctor but their teacher and their friend. It seems here he has found something greater in a tiny medical surgery recently built in the orphanage thanks to the initiative of his fellow countryman, Nord Lee. Empty room with the windows with nothing like, like this. So we have to do everything. So uh, I'm here to teach English and I have very little children. So it's very difficult. You think that you teach English, but actually you don't teach English. You just take care of them and you just put them in an um, English-speaking world. So the, the, the little kids are very nice, we play games, 
they are very uh, kind of messy a little bit. And I didn't have a, te a Khmer teacher at the beginning, which is very important because when you don't speak the language, you cannot teach anything to kids. So it depends. When they are small, you just make games, you just surround them with the uh, English environment, and then you, you, when they get older, you can really work on grammar and some other things. But the kids are very nice. Teaching, despite its obvious value, didn't seem enough for Naughty. He wanted to do something more. With the help of family and friends from back home, he raised two and a half thousand dollars and built a medical surgery in the orphanage where he works. A small sum of money in most developed countries, yet the effect it can have on such an orphanage here in Cambodia is immeasurable. For me, we are reaching the, the limits of the uh, economic model and some people, young people, are trying to think a little bit further. Uh, what are we here for? Is life only about making profit and, and working in companies or also helping each other and doing, doing other kind of stuff? So I think it's a, there, there is a trend. It's like, it's like a trend. I hope it won't stay just a trend uh, and not disappear like, like you wear clothes. Or... For me, it's a bit special because I'm not the typical profile person who go volunteering. Uh, as I told you, I'm 31. So uh, people are globally all younger. It's people starting their studies or people finishing their studies. They have a little bit of time to spend before uh, starting working forever. I'm a little bit different. Uh, I wanted to just to see something else because I've been working, I've been in the world, I've been independent. Working, uh, living on my own, and I wanted to see something else. So what I'm expecting is to have another view of the world, and maybe to change totally my career. I will see when I get back. Volunteers in Cambodia don't like to be compared with tourists. When you ask them what's the difference, they invariably answer with one word, care. Having made the decision not simply to visit a country, but rather to become a part of its everyday life, many volunteers are surprised to find that they care deeply for the people they meet, perhaps more than do even some Cambodians. It's part of my degree. I had to come over here to do my own individual research project. Um, my research project is about the effects of urban development or tourism development on smaller local towns which haven't yet been developed upon. When I first got here I thought that the project was majorly flawed. I thought that we're doing, we're doing all like these village and beach cleanups but the villagers themselves are just littering straight back on the street. But what I found out recently is that there is like education programs as well that they're setting up for the kids. Um, to teach them about proper waste disposal and villages improve so much just from the volunteers being here. Some people have a passion to do conservation, some people have a passion to go and teach and it's good experience um, for like later careers or they just like want to do it because they're passionate about it or for other people I think volunteering is a good excuse to travel like a lot you get catered for, like you're, you're looked after by like the volunteer staff and I think it's a good way to start, you know, seeing the world. The world isn't as small as it used to be. Globalisation, you know, the, the shrinking world and the internet, all these things and people aren't just living their day-to-day -day lives. There's more education, so we're more cultural. Like the town I come from, just outside of Birmingham, um, it's, it's sort of small and a lot of people there, they just they stay there and they work. My friends just had like their second child. Like a lot of them aren't interested. And when I told them I was coming here to volunteer, they were all saying, "Why? Like, why are you coming here? You know, aren't you scared? I would freak out if that was me. But I would freak out if I was the one staying in the hometown and not doing anything else. I think it depends on your personality as well." For Sarah, life on the island hasn't always been idyllic. 
Sometimes she just feels like giving everything up and going back to England for the comforts of electricity, running water and local food. Since coming to Cambodia, she has come to appreciate that even such simple sounding things are, for many in the world, luxuries. Volunteers come to Cambodia with different purposes in mind. Some, like Nortine, come to find themselves through helping others. Some, like Batiste, come simply to take a break from the bustle of life back home. Others hope to earn valuable experience for their resume, but all share one thing in common. All of these people have dreams. Dreams which send them on a different path in search of something new. Dreams which allow them for a time to become more than the relationships which previously defined them. In following their dreams, volunteers learn about themselves and about the wider world, something which earlier had always remained behind the scenes. If I have to say something, like no, I don't have like big dream. I want to be a surgeon, I want to be a good one. And I want to go back in this kind of country when I will be more useful.